Hi, I'm Howard Ungerlander, and I'm here listening to Two Guys Talking Rush 2021. Let it be a good year for everyone. Guys are talking, rush two, 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 two guys, two guys are talking, rush two guys are talking, rush two, two guys, two guys are talking, rush, 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 two guys. And now, get ready for the Two Guys Talking Rush podcast with your hosts, John Kane and Dan Buxman. So, you in, so in the beginning, you're tour manager, but how does the lighting portion oh, get? You know, there really wasn't, like Liam did lighting, but it wasn't what he was, you know, he didn't really know much about it. Yeah. And he was also Alex's guitar tech at the time. And, yep. you know, Ian Grandy was setting up the drums and Jimmy Johnson was taking care of guitars as well. And, um, it, it was, uh, you know, in the beginning, I just volunteered. I'm like, hey, I'll do lights, <laughs> you know? And because uh, I was good at what I, you know, uh, plus I'm a musician, so I could feel the music. Right. Like, I knew what looked great. I always looked at what I would like to see as a fan. So as a fan, looking at all these other shows that blew me away when I was young, I wanted to blow people away and make, you know, bring out the best I could in a situation. And that's what I was doing. Aside from the film Maurice, the lighting at the film Maurice, which may have been a foundation of inspiration for you, was there, were there any other bands uh, out there, well, you mentioned Pink Floyd, of course. Any other bands outside of Pink Floyd that you felt were doing innovation type stuff with lighting? Uh, well, that's why I love Chip Monk so much because yeah. he was doing the Rolling Stones and he, was, and he was lighting them through a mirror on the downstage Mirrors. side. And that blew me away. We were like, he would have spotlights on the ground behind the stage and he would be spotting the guys in the band in a mirror. And they would be lighting up out of the out of nowhere. You wouldn't even know where the light was coming from, although you saw it emanating from behind the stage. But you didn't know where the end end point was because you couldn't see it. Reflection, reflection. Yeah, so that was kind of you know using mirrors was really really pivotal for me. Uh, Pink Floyd's whole you know scare tactics of explosives going off you know at certain points where it would jump out of your seat. Plus the fact that the non-alcoholic refreshments that were being used back then were pretty severe and uh, would, would also help in your expectations of things. And No la uh, no lasers yet. We're not into lasers. That comes a little well, bit. You know, I, it, it's funny you say that. But Blue Oyster Cult, when I was their agent, yeah. I used to hang with them. I was actually tour managing them for a while with Elliot Crow, who was the vice president of C Factor. Yep. Um, couldn't, do, couldn't do a certain tour. I would fill in for him. Yeah. And uh, so I did some tour managing with other bands. Sure. And, uh, you know, lighting. I, did, I dabbled, but Blue Oyster Cult had Dr. David Alfante, who was their lasers at the time. And I was intrigued by what he was doing. And Is that he was, still around? Is he still around? I'm sure he is. Oh, my God. You never know with yeah, all, know. all this COVID now, you know, who knows? No. No. But I hate to say that. But it's I know. Um, anyway, yeah. So I, I dabbled back then. I was fascinated with the lasers and I continued doing that throughout my career. You know, it was, it was kind of fun. So, oh, totally. So one of my first gigs with Rush yeah. coming from New York and, you know, in the, in the car meeting Alex and Getty and, uh, you know, also Neil, they, you know, they said I had a New York attitude where, <laughs> you know, they would say, Hey, you want to have a really good slice of pizza? there's this place up here called Pizza Pizza and you got to try it. It's amazing. And I would go there and it would be like horrible. And um, I would tell them and they're like, oh, everything is better where you're from. Well, I said, well, you know, New York pizza is pretty good. And the best. Uh, at, at that time they hadn't been there. 
So they would say, oh, you know, you Yanks, all you do is, you know, you just think everything is better. I said, well, I'll show you one day when we're down there, you'll see. Meanwhile, we were going to this place called Cochrane, Ontario, freezing cold, minus 40 degrees, right? But, you know, with my New York attitude, and we had the rental car. Yeah. We were driving up to Cochrane and we got about, you know, three and a half hours into the drive. And I remember Giddy saying to me, he goes, hey, you know, I'm sitting here with a denim jacket, you know, and jeans, denim jacket. And they and Giddy goes, hey, where, where's your warm clothes? And I said, what do you mean? And he goes, you have like warmer clothes than that denim jacket, don't you? And I went, no, this is pretty good. And he goes, you know how cold it is out there? And I went, no. He goes, if you go out there now, dress the way you are. And if we had an accident in the car and something happened, you would probably die in a very short period of time. I said, that's bullshit. He goes, there you go again, that New York bullshit attitude. I said, he goes, okay, pull the car over. So I said, oh, yeah, why? He goes, pull the car over. I go, I want you to get out of the car, take a really deep breath of the fresh air that we have up here in Canada. And, and then let me know what you think. So I pull the car over, right? And I get out of the car. As soon as I get out of the car, I hear the electric locks go down on the door, right? I take a really deep breath and it felt like someone took two knives and slashed my nose open. Oh my God. It hurt like hell, right? <laughs> It was so cold, I couldn't believe it. I put my hand on the car door, but they had locked and my sort of skin stuck to the metal oh my god like you know when the kids used to lick the fire <laughs> same type thing with my hand stuck and they're all in the car laughing oh my and I god get back and they go oh mr new york oh yeah so you, you think that you're warm enough in that denim jacket i'm like no they go well there you go goes now welcome to canada i mean you're gonna have to stop and get yourself a park when you get up next truck stop which i had to do right that is amazing. This is this brings to light some important stuff here because, yeah, you're from New York, you're from the United States, and here you are being shipped up north to the outer <laughs> outer regions of wherever, right? And uh, and and but the culture is different with with this sort of you're around the same age, but the, there's a cultural difference, right? So how do you how do you explain the personalities of the guys, uh, the boys, uh, compared to you, what you're a New York punkish, you know, what's good, you know, you know, you've got oh, you're the, hyper, you're, yeah. you're constantly talking, yeah. you're cutting people off in mid sentence, you know, the New York thing. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> it's, it's true, you know, and unfortunately it's not a good trait. It's a flaw, but, uh, you, you grew up in New York, you have a lot of flaws. It's not the best place to, to grow up. But what I did notice was Canadians are so polite, right? And they're laid back and, you know, they're not hyper and they uh, have a lot more uh, patience than, than we do coming from the East Coast. And now that I've spent most of my life in Canada, and I speak with my friends in New York, they go, what kind of accent do you have? That's <laughs> bullshit. You know, it's like, then I hear that coming from them and it's like so funny, right? It's like, uh, you don't sound the same as you used to and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, yeah, I know it's, it's different. But those guys, they were very tolerant in the, uh, you know, they, they tolerated me for 44 years, so. Unbelievable. That's so interesting. Yeah. And do you go back to New York? I mean, do you have family there still? Do you go back to the I States? have my brother, you know, my brother and my, my mom and my brother are in New Jersey. Cool. My dad passed away about six years ago. Oh, and, sorry, uh, man. Yeah, hey, it's, eventually we all will. Right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's the cycle of life. And, uh, you know, I go back when I can. I haven't been there in two years now. Yeah especially with all the COVID stuff. And I know. Uh, it's been a tough go for everyone in the entertainment business. Oh my God, I know, man. I, it's, I, I have so many people that are friends of mine that are, well, that's another part of this podcast that as much as I can remind people to support whatever uh, channel of support there is for, uh, whether it's uh, Sweet Relief or, um, you know, Live Nation uh, and their support, whatever we can do to get the word out and remind people that there are, 
tons and tons, thousands upon thousands of people that are suffering. Uh, not again, not just the, the higher ups, the people selling the popcorn and the and the beer and all that. Everybody's out of work. I know. Everybody, you know, the union, Terrible. you know, yep, everybody is suffering. You know, truck yep. drivers. Yep. You know, everybody. It affects everyone, and no. even people who have families. Um, in the entertainment, they're not earning any money. Zero. I know. It sucks. So, you know, it's it's funny. I, I did uh, an awareness campaign um, on the 22nd of September here in Canada. Yeah. It's called Light Up Live. I had Getty and, uh, you know, Lawrence Gowan from Sticks, the lead yeah. singer. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, he's Canadian and, you know, he's a, he's his own entity in Canada. Yep. And, he's, and then he plays with Sticks in, in the U.S. And yeah. He's great. Book. He's great, man. He's incredible. He's awesome. Yeah. And so he did a great dissertation. So did Getty, did a great dissertation for it, supporting uh, the arts and everyone who's out of work. And awareness campaign is what we did here. Awesome. You know, it's what you need. Anyway. I know. I know. It's true. Um, and I want to talk more about that uh, a little bit later. I, and to stay fresh on, uh, there's a couple of things. One is, very quickly, what was the name of your band? Before I forget. I, which one? It's like, <laughs> the band you were trying to get signed. Loving Arms from the World. Oh, okay. All right. And thinking of New Jersey. It was. it was in the early 70s, like 1970, <laughs> 69, would, 70. <laughs> how would you describe the music? Heavy. Heavy, yeah, like, nice. Uh, Sort of like, I guess it would be mountain. Yeah, it was along the lines of like a mountain. Yeah, and by the way, folks, we've lost a great guitarist. I know Leslie yeah. West, man, unbelievable. I know, that's um, unfortunate. He was a good guy. He, was, I met him a couple of times. A beautiful soul, really totally, guy. man. Yeah, and just a one of the most underrated musicians and forces in rock and roll uh, to ever even, exist, man. Even though his hair blocked my view at Carnegie <laughs> Hall. When I was watching The Who do Tommy oh. for the first time in 1999, oh. yes, he was sitting in front of me. I was in the third row. He was in the second row. His hair was so huge that I couldn't even see the stage. Oh, my God. Hopefully that goes in your book, man, because that is hilarious. Oh. oh, my God. Well, yeah, speaking of Jersey, too, uh, John Cher, the Capitol Theater. Did Rush play the Capitol? Yeah, Rush Several played times? the Capitol. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Um, uh, hang on a second. Take your time, see you, brother. Bye. Okay, see you, buddy. All right, man. Talk with my show up, uh, the Gravis check, and I talked to him already, and everything's good. Oh, good. I'm glad. Okay, see you, bud. Okay, bud. We'll get so, back, man. Yeah, totally, man. So, um, moving forward, you were on the road with Rush for pretty much every tour except Roll the Bones? Yes. Okay. And you were with Queensryche on the Empire for the Empire tour for that, right? I did the Empire tour, and I did the uh, Promised Land tour promised land tour oh those are incredible mm. i love i love queen i mean they're an incredible band right um obviously uh so yeah. who who so who comes in and takes your place when you can't so, okay it was it, it was it was weird because rush had taken um a break they told me they were taking a three-year break and during that course of time everyone would be removed from retainer so that was um a bit strange so because we always would, would be retained, but I guess they were taking more and more time off, and they decided that the, you know, you, you have to fend for yourself. Now, you know, I have to work. Yeah, of course. Yeah. No, I don't make the kind of money that the guys in Rush make. So. Oh, of course. Yeah, you got to stay you know. employed, man. Yeah, so you got to keep working. So, what I had to do was find another job, and in the meantime. Um, I know it was sort of set up behind the scenes, but I didn't find out about it till much later. But sure. Peter Mensch from Q Prime gives me a call and says, hey, what are you doing? Like he knew what I was doing because he had spoken with Ged, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, it was a setup. It, it was weird, but it was a setup on, on his part, I think. I don't think Ged knew about it. Sure. Anyway, um, Ged basically told me, you know, um, We'll let you know when we need you again. And thanks. And I said, all right. So Peter Minch calls and says, listen, I got a, a deal for you. He said, um, I have three years of work for you. Just happens to be the same exact amount of time period. And he goes, I want you to do Queensryche and Tesla for me. So I said, really? He goes, yeah. He said, but uh, 
I had done Metallica in 1983. I was Metallica's uh, tour manager for the Ride the Lightning tour. Wow. Now, when the bus flipped, I wasn't there. Yeah. I actually had to go do Rush the week before the bus accident. Mm. I, I hired Bobby Schneider to take my place. Oh my he says he thanks me to this day for almost getting him killed. But it's like, Unbelievable. And that was an unfortunate thing. But Very much so. Anyway, so I, you know, and Cliff Bernstein, was, who's partners with Peter Manchin Q Prime. Yeah. Um, you know, it's Cliff's company, and uh, you know, he's always supported. He broke Rush on Mercury Records when he worked there. Right. So the Q Prime guy said, "Listen, here you go. You know, I I need you to uh, agree to this three-year deal." goes you can't go back and work for rush if anything goes down you're not going back so you have to make sure so i you know i called up ray daniels and spoke with ray and said listen i got offered this gig and he said take it basically and i did but none of the guys in rush knew that because mm -hmm. ray never told them and i never really spoke to them after that because they were taking a break yeah so i went ahead and did tesla and I, uh, the great radio controversy tour great and uh, then I went into Promise, no, not Promise Line, uh, Empire. Yeah. I also worked with Queensryche on their um, Operation Mind Crime oh. videos before that, and uh, you know, came up with some concepts for them. Oh, those are those so, are huge. Those are huge albums, man. I mean, yeah, incredible. And so Operation Mind Crime was brought to life on the Empire tour, and I used the anime, you know, all my animators that I used with Rush um in the early days to bring it to life and uh did some innovative things on the, on those tours when i had you know one of the uh the cast members on the screen you know in, in the video do a duet in real time with jeff tate which was you know not done very often before that yeah that was uh so that's so cool yeah i love, I love that man I, I love queensrake and i love those records so right on those Cool. So getting back to Rush. Yeah. So I needed to, um, you know, find out what was happening. And I didn't until Ged phoned me up when I was in Europe with Queensryche and said, hey, when are you coming back here? Because we're going back on tour. And I said, well, uh, yeah, but it's only been like, you know, a little <laughs> over two years. And you said it was three years. He goes, well, you know, we decided we're going to go back out. I said, well, I can't. I said, because I'm on this Queensryche tour that's going for 16 months. They had a huge hit single, Silent Lucidity. And he's like, well, what's going to happen then? And I'm like, well, I'll figure it out. I'll design it for you. I'll, you know, I'll put it all together, but I'll have to get somebody else to run it. And I did. I found another guy yeah. that was available at the time to run it. And uh, he didn't do a, the, the greatest job he changed my design without me knowing about it mm -hmm. told a lot of the vendors that um i was fired so oh. and then i never heard that story but that's that's not cool no it was not cool yeah. anyway uh after all was said and done you know uh i went out i designed it there were some issues i went and tried to correct it i flew back out you know, upon the band's request, but hey, it is what it is, and uh, yeah, just you know. But I like what the what the agents in New York would say when they would come to that show. They would tell the band things like, you know, without that lighting guy that you had with all those distracting lights, uh, your music would shine through so much better. It was comments like that would come out. Oh my God. But, you know, Getty, Getty and Al, and you know, all those guys were too smart. To of course. That. So anyway, so I got brought back after that three years. Yeah. So, I, yeah, I, uh, I designed the Roll the Bones tour, but I did not operate it. It was the only tour I didn't operate. Little, little side story there. Um, you know, I have to say a couple, couple things here. When, when you talk about working with animators, uh, you know, I have a visual arts background. I, I teach graphic design and um, media and communications uh, at the college level. And, you know, my, one of the first shows, the first rush, you know, listen, every fan, and it comes up a lot, will listen to rush albums. And if they haven't seen, hadn't seen the band, once they see the band, 
something happens. It's it becomes bigger and more important, right? Um, the music, and I feel bad for any friend of mine that I, I, I shame them because they should have seen Rush. You know, uh, upon my uh, suggestions, I have a few of them uh, because I was bullied for liking Rush uh, in high school and all that. But a lot, a lot of people were. But I, um, I have to say, once you see Rush live, it it something happens. Uh, you get a uh, a different sense of what not just the production is bringing to the table, but the artistry, the aesthetic. And in particular, for me, that introduction was the Hold Your Fire tour. And uh, the as barbaric as the animations look now, because of back then, to me, they were beautiful and they still are. I mean, the, the, that cover of the... Um, of the uh, of the show of uh, show of hands album and those animations that are used even in songs like marathon uh, where you're using this sort of this laser man this running, yeah, running I, man. dude I love that so much it never gets old for me you know so yeah. you know it's beautiful stuff you know and that that sticks in my head I appreciate you know? it. oh totally man you know, yeah. it's, it's, you know I I came up with um, all of the designs for Rush yeah and it, there was some kind of, um, I had a connection very close with, with Getty um, all the time. When is he we, calling the shots? I mean, it seems like Getty's pretty much calling. He has you know, the artistic vision a lot. And, yeah. yeah. Get, you, Ged's an, uh, an amazing artist. Yeah, yeah. And, um, People you know, forget that. Yeah. And I, I do what I, I deem lighting choreography. And I get into the lyrics. I create my effects to the lyrics mm -hmm. to the point of ad nauseum. <laughs> and, uh, you know, sometimes I used to think that I was the only one that would know that this is happening in this song <laughs> because I was following lighting with the lyrics, you know, the lyrics with the lighting. And, you know, you see black and white, but I see red, not blue. And, you know, things like that. I would take that and actually make it go down until one day I got a response. One of the guys in the audience came up to me and went, hey, you did that change in that song. And I'm like, yeah. Now it makes it all worthwhile, doesn't it? When oh, totally. Someone acknowledges that. But, it's, but yeah. still, there was a lot to it. So in creating the Rush show, I would sit down with, with Ged and our animating people. And uh, later on, as... The years progressed. The animating people became Ged's brother and Dale Heslip. And, uh, you know, so the, the teams had changed. And then it was in the family. And, uh, and of course, it got, more it got more elaborate, too. I mean, yeah, so yeah. basically, we would brainstorm and come up with these concepts. And then I would, I would light it. But the one thing that I was always really, really uh, emphatic on doing was coordinating the colors of the imagery with what I use on stage and I would have to go into the animators and discuss more than just ideas but coloring and how it would deliver to what medium we were using sometimes we we're using 35 millimeter projectors we we're projecting on screens sometimes we we're using LED walls you know yeah and um, I always would treat my walls especially with leds because they were so harsh in the beginning i would put a, a black shark's teeth scrim in front of the led to soften it to make it look more like a film texture yeah. so in the front of house you wouldn't even see that there was a black shark's teeth in front of the uh, the video wall and that gave it a really nice texture and blend everything in because it's uh you need darkness to create magic yeah. So that's why people don't understand when you're doing media. Um, you would probably appreciate this, that if you have a black stage and the last thing you want to see is a raster of the screen, you don't want to see a big square in your face all night long. Right. So you want to see depth. You want depth. You see depth. So if you have your video come out of black so you don't see the definition of the screen, it's magic. You can, you know, these are these are like vaudeville. I mean, this stuff goes. This this isn't like uh, yeah, you know, well, new, it's, theater. Yeah, it's, it's theater, right? It's the origins of theater, right? The yeah. the the magic of the theatrical production. Whether you're working with puppets or you're working with video, 
uh, there's a there's a formula uh, for this stuff uh, uh, in, in in live concerts, whatever sort of uh, uh, whatever sort of show you're putting on, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And um, you know, I always say that what is the greatest cue in lighting? It's blackout. It's the strongest, most effective cue you'll ever experience. Nothing better than blacking out a stage and then hitting an artist with a spotlight oh, no. out of the blue. It's like switching a channel on a TV, yeah. right? But it's so dramatic, blackout. Yeah, Roger, Wa Roger Waters, man. That's all I think about when I think about it. There was one instant, I saw Waters live on a solo tour and boom, blackout, spotlight. Yeah. And then in, in behind him, he had like a living room set and his band was just, were just like playing cards in the dark. And I know, it was awesome. I, dude, I, it freaked me out. <laughs> and I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't even like tripping or anything. I'm looking at, I'm like, whoa, this is a mind f, you know, like, yeah. whoa, you know. And that's such a subtle, simple thing, right? It's theater. It's good theater. That's nobody, the nobody does theater like Roger Waters, man. I mean, Jesus yeah. Christ. Well, Pink Floyd. That's, Pink Floyd, man. Yeah. You know, but Peter Gabriel did theater well. Yeah, he did. You're right. Yeah. You know, he's one of. The, I mean, he's a genius. Can't give all the credit there because Peter Gabriel, you know, Genesis, Peter Gabriel, yeah. they all. Amazing artist, David Bowie. Amazing, yeah. artist. incredible. You know, you 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 can't let those people go. You're right. You know? You're right. I like the, I like the 1975. I think they're cool. I think there's a yeah, lot they're, of they're you know, up and coming yeah. bands. You know, big time. Yeah, big time. Well, going back, going back to the very early days, you know, you weren't. You, were you depending on lighting at the venue or did you, were you lugging around, you know, follow spots on a truss with colored gel? I mean, colored gels. What were you doing with this? In stuff? the early days, I was using the headliners equipment. Okay. And very little of it because some, some of them were really ignorant. Yeah. You know, so, some of the headliners I was dealing with would like harsh, you know? Yeah. You know, in the early days, Aerosmith, they would have 600 lights and I was able to use maybe 16 of them. And uh, we were not able to have a sound check until, you know, ever. We, we, could, we couldn't put our equipment on stage until after the doors opened. And then they would go and they would tweak the limiters on the PA and cut the PA in half. So when the band came on stage, it sounded like a wimpy radio. It was like, wow. You know, that's, 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 that's punk, that's punkish yankee boston like stuff right there man you know that's what that but is I'll, but, but but i'll tell you that is uh it's good because it just showed how freaked out they were by rush because rush was so powerful as a trio yeah um you know being a musician and when i hear when i heard rush there was a there was something happening that was there was a chemistry and there was a a physical um energy source that was happening that transcended anything that you go oh this band is like insanely great, amazing and um and i just don't say that because i work for rush i'm yeah. because you know i don't work for rush anymore <laughs> and yeah. uh, and well when did you realize that rush were different what was it when neil came in or or, well, well, you know, you were during that tipping point. When Neil was the only one I ever saw. So Yeah, right. Yeah, right, right, right. right. And actually, Neil, when he first started with Rush, was not very, you know, he, he was good, but not what he became. Right. Yeah, he was nowhere near what he was. Yeah. And then, you know, in the beginning, he was, you know, I never heard John Rutsey, but, you know, he was not, he, Neil was a, a, a prog guy, so he was progressive thinking drummer you know yeah um, and the guys in rush who just love progressive like yes and you know steve hackett all those guys you know i remember getty turning me on to barkley james harvest you know he loved this song called child of the universe and you know it was incredible and neil i believe changed the way rush sounded and get an owl just grooved into it so heavily, and it became this machine. It was really in the in 21, the twenty one twelve Capitol uh, Theater Capitol in Passaic. Yeah, it was before it was before twenty one twelve. I think maybe yes. Um, I heard it. I, I I heard the gelling of it. Fly by night. I heard the gelling of it. 
you know, when they would play the music off any of the, any of the tracks off the first Rush album, you know, Fighting My Way, I heard it. Yeah. You know, Working Man, you heard it. Um, In the End was one of my favorite songs. Yeah, I love that, yeah. And they played that live. It was mind boggling how good that was. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I heard it from the outside because I was in the audience all the time because I was doing the lighting. So I felt the power of it. And as they progressed, got better. And, you know, I tried to progress the show. Every show we had done was always different. Yeah. I never used the same route twice. And every concept was different. And my ideas came from natural items, natural, what I call natural causes. I would be sitting out in the field at night, seeing the car headlights through trees and watching what happened with the mist in the air and sitting on a porch with wind chimes, visualizing them as video walls. And, you know, it's just kind of crazy thinking. Yeah. Plus probably all the acid trips I had done when I was young <laughs> sort of contributed to all that. Whatever, man, whatever. It's all, it's all good. <laughs> you know. Good for you. But it all, you know, it all blends together, you know, just every, every, all my experiences. I was, I was driven. I'm still driven, you know? Yeah. I, I, uh, I love doing what I do and I, I will never stop. I, you know, I have this company production design international, which right now I'm trying to save, you yeah. know, and keep, keep alive. We were just fin We were just doing lasers for Foo Fighters and Tool and we did lasers for Kid Rock. And I was doing a lot of work, Yeah, you know, uh, creative laser shows. And, you know, I'm, now I'm sitting here with, you know, 60 laser systems and- It'll come back, man. I'm having fun though. Yeah. And we're doing TV commercials now. We're doing some movies, Yeah. you know, a few things, but nothing that it's, you know, I needed to come back because yeah. other than that, there's no income. Right. Well, you know, my partner, Brian, and I were very smart, you know, with the, with how we dealt with the money. And yeah. that's why we're still around. And hopefully when this thing, we come out of this black hole, we will be emerging victorious. I, I think so. People are really um, feeling the need to to get out and to be be with one another and uh it's yeah. inevitable it'll come back with a force man you know most definitely i'm anxious i'm anxious about it we just need people not to be stupid about it and right. to understand the science behind what's happening yeah um, you know the spanish flu was the one that mirror images this and there were five waves of that yeah so you know we're on wave two here so you know buckle up and be smart about it yep. and you know you got to listen to what the scientists say as we all know it's natural science huh there it is man no pun no pun intended no uh no uh, uh nothing to do with rush of course natural science one of my favorite songs but so you, any any specific tour i mean we always ask fans what their favorite albums are and you know clockwork angel comes comes up a lot what a magnificent record to kind of end the career this beautiful career of a magnificent band like rush uh but the show the shows for clockwork angels were especially very special and, and beautiful job man i mean i can't say enough uh, and i'm not blowing smoke i mean i saw a few of them and they were just incredible uh mm -hmm. the record's incredible the tours were were incredible um so uh for you uh, with this career this 40-year career and several umpteen tours any particular tour stand out for you that was especially very special uh for you moving pictures why why moving pictures it was I... awesome yeah it was amazing it was an amazing album great songs on it um i just enjoyed that album that just was one of my favorites and um you know it had some some of the best tracks on it. The other ones, I mean, I mean, I like them all, but you know, I loved um, you know stuff they did with Time Machine, Clockwork Angels. You know, it, it was the next. It's next level. Well, Clockwork Angels has a let's like anchor in on a steampunk theme, right? How do yeah. you how do you translate that theme into a lighting design? Like, what do 
what do you do to prepare for something like that? You know, it's, it was the concept. The concept was going through all of the tours backwards, right? So that you would start with the most recent design and go back to the early days when you had basically park hands. And it was the transition from, from that to where you started throughout the course of the show that was, you know, incredible for delight. Mm -hmm. And with the, with the help of Dale Heslip and, and uh, Alan Weinrib, you know, mm -hmm. those two guys were instrumental in assisting in bringing that to life. And it's a, a huge undertaking because not only do you have to train the road crew of what to do, when to do it, but also the lighting crew on when, when things have to happen, when the curtains have to be pulled, when, you know, certain uh, equipment's being moved, where we have to put the lights, mm -hmm. where the lights go after the equipment's moved, how to strike the lights to minimize the stage. Mm -hmm. um, plus it's all the engineering that I had to create with the moving, st moving structure overhead to change. We had lasers. We had an innovative laser situation that we actually, my company had built la little laser heads that were programmable that we used on, on that tour as well in blue. They were only would do blue. And, uh, you know, I used those, you know, various sequences. Um, so, so Sebastian Richard studying under you at this point? I mean, how is Sebastian? Sebastian Richard? Richard. Yes. Richard. Sebastian is a great guy. So I would sit down with Sebastian and I would tell him, this is what I've created. This is what I'd like to do with the lighting during the course of the song. Um, I, would I would make him like, okay, let's go to how a rush show is created because you have to understand that the band likes to get acclimatized to the hours that they have to be on stage. So when you're off tour for a long period of time and you're going to sleep at normal hours as, as most human beings do, not rock stars. And uh, when you're on tour, you don't sleep very much. If you're lucky to get four or five hours a day. And as a band member, they would get more because they can sleep until the crack of noon and longer because they didn't have to be at the venue till four in the afternoon for sound checks. So when I create the show, I have to create it when I have peace and quiet. I can't have the band on stage playing. I can't talk to my staff. You know, I can't piece things together. So I have to do it once the band are done doing what they do is when I go to work. And normally it's around 10 o'clock at night till about nine in the morning. So that's my shift. So what I would do is the, I would come in around three, hang out with the band. They would go through their set with the house lights on. And then I would take 10 days after they left, I would try to do three songs a day. Some days I could only get one. Some days I'd have to do two, some days I'd have to do four. And those days were long. So after the band were done, the next day I would come back. And when the band hit those songs that I had done the night before, I would run, I would block the house lights out, run those two songs or three songs with them when they were playing live, right? And then I would shut the lights, I'd turn the lights back on and they would continue playing their set until they were done. And the next night I would do the next three songs. And this went on for 10 days until the whole show is created. And that was the process. And that's my process of how I put it together. So unfortunately for the guys that work with me on my crew that I made stay those hours, you know, I have to cut half the lighting crew and send them to sleep so they could come in the next day and fix things that went wrong. But that is, that is the, the process and the rest of the people would stay with me. It's like watching paint dry, but I'd have to go through all the cues, create the cues, make sure, you know, everybody has got the timings right. And then eventually you have to bring in some of the road crew to move things around on stage to create the changes. And then Dale would have to run them through the changes while the programming was happening. It was, it was tedious. 
So how much is how much is automated in this process and how much is physical cues? So you're hitting, you obviously have to watch the song, you know where you're going to be hitting certain cues within the song. You know, is there an automated portion to this where you can rely on the automation to? No, no there's okay. nothing that's automated here. Okay. Okay, so this is all, this is all happening in real time. Yeah. So what is automated are, I have a computer that I'm stacking cues up in and I'm running down a cue list verse bridge chorus cue list mm -hmm. right in addition to the verse bridge chorus cue list i have a console on the side which enables me to execute cues off the main console to my left i have an assistant to my left who monitors the main console and fixes anything that goes wrong during the show so i don't have to stop running the show from the console on the right the console on the right is a huge matrix sort of console that allows me to not only run the queue list down, but to augment every queue in that queue list with a hundred different variables by touching it, by manual execution. So all it's like, of my a, like a dance. It's like a dance. It's a dance. And that's where the musical choreography comes in with lighting. So I'm actually following the band's music with my fingers while I'm running down my queue list. And at the end of each song is a blackout and an ending and blacks out. I hit a button that turns me to the next page, rejigs the whole board to the next song with all those variables changed, you know, completely. Wow. So I have a whole new set of variables. So over the course of those 10 days, not only are the cues being created, but I have to memorize the variables. Wow. Right. And it takes me after the 10 days are over those variables aren't completely memorized. It takes me another seven days of playing concerts to get it to where it becomes second nature. And all this time when this is happening, I'm also calling cues, calling pyro cues, spot cues. I've got, you know, eight spotlights going, you know? Wow. I'm, I'm talking to video. Right. Talking to everyone, right? So I'm directing the show plus r running it. So I'm very busy. It's like an air traffic control. Oh my God, man. It must be like, yeah. it must be nerve wracking too. I mean, you must, anytime you hear a rush song, you must close your eyes and just do your dance in your head of the lighting, man. It must just, you must visualize all that in some You're way. Right. It drives me insane actually. Oh, it must, man. You know, just thinking in terms of where you were and wh where that, how that song was pronounced uh, in a, in, in lit during a concert that must be like oh, yeah. i don't think i've ever thought of it you know um the same way a choreographer uh or a conductor for an orchestra would uh would would do um that's 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 amazing stuff and again going back to the origins of all this you're not just using house lights anymore you're not trucking around a truss with some fall spots now we're into some programmable shit right i mean now we're like we have consoles we have assistants we have a whole lighting production that is for a specific aesthetic for a band that relies on that aesthetic and when you design this lighting system i have to look at all the venues we're playing in advance and take the largest stage and the smallest stage and the, and the venue uh, characteristics so that this rig can be chopped down where we get into a venue that it can't fit into i have to make it convertible so i know exactly what i'm going to do when i go to the venue that is not big enough to run the whole rig wow and then you have to eliminate sections of it so that it's designed with like almost like a lego kit so you can detach certain pieces at yeah. certain times to make it you know fit without losing the aesthetic of the show incredible plus i i use in this show i use gyroscopes so right. the, you know, the spinning the, they spin right well they're they're they spin horizontally horizontally right? Yeah, right right so they were stabilizing lighting fixtures that were dropping out of the air so that when the lighting fixture would pan around and move they would stay they would keep it stationary so i had lights coming down out of the air on chain motors on yyz yyz you did that yeah, for yyz yeah yeah i mean you know between the wheels as well between the wheels yeah 
And, you know, I used them on various songs and dropped them in. The little stranger auto. But you don't do that all the time. I know there's a sensibility to your work where you're not going to overdo it. I mean, there if if a lighting if a if a truss drops down, you know, a, a fixed, you're not going to do it 50 times in a show. You're going to you have a sense of it's like you're not going to reveal the whole thing constantly, so fans get tired of that. You want to there's just sort of a specialness to what you're doing, right? Oh, I mean, yeah. I, know like, some... I, used to, I used to really piss off my lighting crew. It was like I used to have um, an effect that I would use. It would maybe be 150 fixtures, but I'd use it for 30 seconds, and then that would be it. And every day they'd have to put up those 150, and they would like, oh, do you really need us to put those? Yes, I do. <laughs> I do need you to put those up. Yeah. Because in that 30 seconds, it's insane what's happening, and then you'll always remember that. And that's part of the design. Yeah. Well, thank, 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 thank you for that, man. That's that's special. You know, oh. that makes it that makes it special. So, you how many? So now you're trucking uh, large equipment. How many trucks? Uh, how, how for an average tour? Let's say like Clockwork Angels. How many trucks do you have to uh, have uh, on the road to support eight. eight trucks? Wow. Which is not a lot. Not when you look at like Lady Gaga with 29 trucks. Wow. I mean, you know, 29? Wow. Or, you, or look at you too with their like, yeah. you know, yeah. 100 and some odd trucks. Whatever. That's that's insane. You know, eight trucks is economically sane. Yeah. You know? And considering one of the trucks is merchandise. <laughs> right. For an entire tour, right? So, so you'd like you say, trucks. seven trucks of gear. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. You have structural engineering pieces, right? Rigging. Right. That takes up a huge amount of space. Yep. The lighting rig, the audio, the video, the video screens, you know, it's a lot. There's one effect you used on the Clockwork Angels uh, for the song The Wreckers that had a 3D effect that I remember distinctly because I was like, wow, rain. that's pretty. Yeah, the rain. So you had rain on a screen, but also the lights were sort of positioned. Rain. That was amazing. Well, I took the video and I took the lighting and I put them on the exact same angle as the video. So it became three dimensional. And I used a very, very tight pin spot with a gogo, which is a piece of metal that, I, that goes in the light that limits it to a little tiny, which is called the little donut, right? Mm -hmm. So that looks like rain, rain shafts. Yeah. And, you, and you set a preset focus in that direction and then you put a chase sequence into it that spaces it out and puts it like actually we're running shadows through it all right so that the light when the light is on there's a series of shadows where you're blacking out that light and, and revealing it and blacking it out and revealing it and blacking it out yeah you have those going off each other at different times it appears like it's rain yeah and with the rain behind it it just makes it three-dimensional and those, and that's something that I really enjoyed doing. Yeah, yeah, amazing. I love, I love that effect a lot, and I remember distinctly watching that, being at awe with that. You know, yeah. nice job. Um, so, you know, what's your favorite part of the process? Do you like the initial design, the programming, or the execution, or do you, does it all just? I like the, well, I like the execution. I use, I use a series of programmers because I used to program my own shows, and then I got into the situation where something would go wrong, you'd lose your train of thought, you'd have to go fix that problem. And I, it just drove me insane. So I started using my own, my different programmers. So Tim Grievous, who was a really good guy, yeah. was programming, he was, was my, one of my main programmers. Matt Drusbick was another programmer. Keith Hoagland was another programmer. Um, you know, I went through a lot of programmers in, in the process. You know, um, Andy O'Toole was a programmer for me. Yeah. Matt Tucker was a programmer for me. I had a lot wow. of programmers. Wow. And, you know, over the, over the course of many tours, and I drove them insane. That's why I had so many programmers. <laughs> Errol Raynard was one of my friends, a programmer. I made him once do for the, for the uh, Buffalo Sabres, a 396-step chase. <laughs> because before, the, before the days of, you know, being able to just use your own built-in effects, you uh, you had to create your own chases. So. Amazing, that's incredible. I created well, my two chases in the early days, and I had Bob C build me a matrix board to put pins in to create the chases. Another le another legend to come out of the the Filmer East uh, camp, huh? Oh yeah, there's a lot of legends. Amazing.
a lot of laws. Um, so lasers, we go back to lasers. I know, and I forgot that before Pink Floyd, uh, Blue Oyster Cult were famous for their laser shows. Oh, yeah. Um, the, from my research, the introduction of lasers for Rush occurred around the Grace Under Pressure tour? Yes. And were you inspired by Pink Floyd and Blue Oyster Cult for Absolutely. the introduction of lasers? Yeah. Absolutely. Were they yeah. expe were they expensive to use back then or what? Oh yeah, they were, they were really expensive to. First of all, they were water cooled. They were paid in the neck. They were water cooled. They were eight feet long. And the power supplies were four hundred pounds. They needed four hundred and eighty volts that would be stepped down through a transformer, which was another six hundred pound item. Wow. You'd have to water cool them with sixty pounds per square inch, wow. and they would eventually take up a three hundred three phase power supply. Wow. So yeah, they were a hassle, and if they and they were glass tubes that would be water cooled, so you'd have water pumps and hoses and a lot of water on the stage, and it's kind of like ironic where water and electricity blend together. Yeah, that is weird. Which is you know that's an electrocution uh, yeah. nightmare, and um, yeah, it was a scientific piece of equipment. We trooped around for until about maybe eight years ago, and when the tubes would crack because they were made of glass, they would cost you twenty to $30,000 to repair them. Wow. And it would be a process that would take months, to, a month by the time you shipped it out and get it back. Wow. Yeah. That, that's insane. Um, and it's what's really interesting is that this is a point in Russia's career where they're talking about different things. The lyrics are about, you know, maybe dystopian themes, uh, futuristic themes, and then in come the lasers. Was that a conscious choice to yeah. mer merge the... To step it up to the next level, to, you know, to bring that futuristic feel to the, to the stage. Yeah. You, know? you even said it. Marathon. I mean, it's right there. I love it. You know? I love those visuals, man. A running um, bitmap, you know, it's like I love it. Your file for you, you know, the '80s rush gets a lot of. I love '80s rush, you know, a lot, and um, probably mostly because it's when I first got introduced. And but the the songs are great, and the albums are beautiful, and I don't know, whatever. Um, and I love that about Rush is that they've it's kind of an a la carte thing, you know. You know the qual, you're getting good quality, and it's just something different. I mean, who wants to eat the same old piece mm -hmm. of steak every time? So how? In your view, what happened with the music then, and how did it change your artistry with uh, with with the, the change in music? Was there a, a in, more, in, in, in the eighties? Yeah, in the eighties. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it was. I, I sort of go with the flow on that. Being a musician, I sort of like was intrigued by it. Yeah. So that just creates a lot of, you know, it's like when I come up with my designs. There's a lot of times I don't even hear the music. They just say, this is the name of the album. And I come up with something. Yeah. I think one of the most amazing things was when I came up with this sort of snake-like truss before Snakes and Arrows. Yeah. I didn't even know the name that was going to be Snakes and Arrows. Oh, wow. But I just, I just came up with this snake truss because that's the design that I came up with. It was just thinking about something different. And then they told me the name of the album. And I'm like, what? That's weird. Any uh, any horror story? We hear about the greatness uh, uh, on the road, but any any tragedies with regard to uh, the technology uh, production uh, with uh, with uh, Rush on the road in your well, there's, there's always tragedy. Yeah, you know, um, with the production, it was only when somebody would throw a drink like a big gulp in the air, and it would land on my lighting console and oh, short the whole thing out. That would really suck. Any problems <laughs> with trusses or trusses getting stuck or fixtures getting uh, jammed or anything like that? Always. Yeah. Always, but nothing that would create tragedy, you know? Yeah. I mean, the closest thing we had to tragedy, we did have a long throw horn fall out of the air one day and split Alex's double neck in half, missing Jack Secret, his guitar, his, you know, our keyboard tech. Yeah. Tony Geranius, who was also on Blue Oyster Cult, yeah, Rush, and almost killed him. But luckily, no one was hurt. But it did split the double neck in half. That's incredible, man. I know. Well, you know, 
the, the wonderful thing about Rush to wrap up here is that they've, it seems as though they've, they've made a conscious decision to keep really good people around them and really talented people around them, which maintain the quality of of the ex the live experience. They were fantastic people. Oh my God! I mean, we hear family, family, family all the time uh, with all of our uh, uh, interviews with um, with Rush production people. So I, yeah. I think that's just a testament to the to the product that you're getting, right? Uh, and and thank you so much for the legacy, your legacy, your uh, passion and drive, as you say, for maintaining uh, this quality uh, that we've all experienced. Such an important. It's made such a, a significant impact on so many people. You may not even realize. So, and I'm saying yeah. this as a repre representative of every fan that listens to this podcast. Um, so, how does Rush impacted your life? <laughs> Rush was my life. It was I. It was a life's work that I put into Rush. I'll put it this way: When I came to Toronto for the first time, I was 21. Okay. Wow. So there you go. And. You know, I moved here. This is my city. I mean, I've lived here longer than I've lived anywhere else in the United States. I'm actually Canadian and American. Wow. Right? So I'm dual citizen. It suits you well, my friend. You no, know, I, I, I enjoy <laughs> it. You know, I have a lovely wife, uh, Ursula, who uh, I met here in Canada. Cool. And we've been married for like 32 years now. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. That's awesome, man. And um, how can folks find out more about what you're doing these days? Um, my, I'm putting up a new website, but it's uh, pdieffects.com. Okay. The letter P, D, I, the letter F, the letter X.com. Um, you can see what I've been up to. Um, you know, my Instagram account is PDI. Production Design International has their own Instagram account. You can check in there and see some humorous things. And uh, I asked this. I asked this of every uh, guest. Your top five Rush albums. It, it's going to be difficult, I know. But if you were to pick your top five, what would they be? Uh, I'd have to say my top five would have to be Twenty One Twelve, Moving Pictures. I I love Hold Your Fire. Um, I like uh, Clockwork Angels for sure. And uh, I'd have to say permanent waves. Yeah, that comes up all the time. And uh, any any words any words to fans? Uh, this may be an opportunity just to say something to the fans that have that are listening in. Thank you. I thank all the fans. I mean, I spoke. I've spoken with so many of them. I've spoken with so many of you guys, and girls, which was unusual towards the end. And uh, I just have to say thank you. It's. If it wasn't for you, that I wouldn't be doing what I do. And I really, really appreciate it. And uh, thanks for coming for all those years. And, and thank you, Howard. We really appreciate you and what you've done and your dedication. Oh, you're welcome. You so, know, any, anytime you want to chat, I'm here. Totally. And thank, thank you very much for joining us on Two Guys Talking Rush. Oh, you are welcome. Well, Dan, uh, what'd you think of the, uh, the episode? Many insightful questions were asked and many interesting answers were given. That's what I thought. And as a Rush fan community, we are now richer for the experience. Oh, Dan, thank you so much. And uh, You're Howard, welcome. <laughs> Howard's a really great guy, right? A, a true oh, yeah, legend, absolutely. A true legend, yeah. Yep. I mean, you've been to Rush so shows. Uh, you know, we've talked about sound. What do you have to say about lighting at Rush shows? I mean, was, did that ever like blow you away? Like, whoa, look at the lighting, you know? Um, all I can say is that when I saw Rush, it was just always 100% tip top. You could, you could not complain about anything about it at all. Uh, and then the fact that I don't really have much to say about the lighting means I didn't think about the lighting because everything was just going off perfectly. And it, it was just this kind of well-executed complement to the rest of the show. Um, everything about them was like that. There was just, there was no, you know, one thing that was kind of like, ah, they didn't really like, you know, take that as far as they could. Everything was always excellent, including the lighting, even if you're not the sort of person who is inclined to notice that sort of thing. If the lighting is bad, you notice. Yeah. So this wasn't that way. Yeah. Or you can't notice because, 
you can't see them there's no light in. and that's how you notice yeah. <laughs> it's like what what is what is that yeah. flick the switch yeah. um but uh yeah i think you know one important thing to take from this episode is that rush is a good example of uh, a band that that uh, grew in in a very young grew out of a very young industry that wasn't yet developed with and and when Howard as he says in the interview when they started you know so, the sound wasn't so great the lighting wasn't so great the technology just wasn't there and you kind of built it as you went along and I and I you know when I was talking to Howard about it it's like oh well, look at where, look at where it's come from and look at what you can do now what you couldn't do then you know yeah um, so it's just you know, from from lasers, the onset of lasers. We talked about, uh, as you remember, we were talking about Blue Oyster Cult being so famous for their laser shows, and Pink yeah. Floyd famous for their laser shows. And uh, he talked about how expensive it was to run lasers at shows, but how much of a spectacle they created at a show. Right. Oh, yeah. any good laser. I remember Deep Purple. I saw the Pink, the Perfect Strangers tour. And I just remember distinctly those lasers coming down and going up and being like, whoa, you know, because. Yeah. Laser. I love a good laser show, man. What yeah. I saw, yes, on the nine hundred one two five tour. That wow, same year. that's a good one. Yeah, wow. and uh, they they had like I mean it was I guess like kind of primitive laser stuff where you know like they would sing a song and then there would be a star, and then it would just go away, you know. So it was it was like very much at the beginning of like I guess we can do this. Let's try this. Some ideas are better than others, you know. But I mean, eventually, it just becomes this thing that people expect yeah you better have it or or we've got problems you know yeah and totally. the, you know and the fire and explosions and all that sort of thing that, yeah. that becomes part of the ticket yeah. you know yeah well how guys like howard gave their life uh, uh to to rush and to make uh the experience better for us and aside from him being with our favorite band he is also a pioneer uh in uh, lighting design and should be known for that uh like the many others before him like chipmunk and uh uh and several others that we talked about obviously the Fillmore east and so much uh innovation coming out of the Fillmore east of course many people that came out of the Fillmore east went on to uh, uh support the woodstock festival and so much innovation was done there and and on mm -hmm. and on and on uh so there it is folks well th thanks again folks for tuning in to another impressive episode of your favorite rush podcast my name is john kane i am the delightful dan buckspan and this is two guys talking rush and what can i say folks rush rush rules Guys are talking, rush two, 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 two guys, two guys are talking, rush two, two guys are talking, rush two, two guys, two guys are talking, rush, 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 two guys. Live music inspires millions around the world, but the concerts we all enjoy wouldn't be possible without the countless crew members working behind the scenes. As COVID-19 puts concerts on pause, we want to extend a helping hand to the touring and venue crews who depend on shows to make a living. Crew Nation was created to do just that. Crew members are the backbone of the live music industry, and we hope you'll join us in supporting them through this temporary intermission until we can once again unite millions around the world through the power of live music. Crew Nation is powered by Music Forward Foundation, a charitable 501c3 organization that will be administering the fund. Live Nation has committed $10 million to Crew Nation, contributing an initial $5 million to the fund, then matching the next $5 million given by artists, fans, and employees dollar for dollar. Please support Crew Nation at www.livenationentertainment.com slash crewnation.